and welcome to the PUC and public meeting on judicial accountability. Finally, I will introduce the speakers and both Aspi and Chandan Chandan are both friends of mine. Uh, very sort of very approachable and despite their seniority, despite the standing that they have, they have been very very helpful to all of us whenever we need help. They have, been, they have come out of the way to help us. As far as Aspi is concerned, Aspi Chilar, he is the senior most advocate in the Bombay High Court. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> a very very respected uh, person, uh, liked by all. I mean, though he has been my opponent in some cases, he has been a very fair opponent. And I would say that he has taken up a number of PI cases, one of which was the beef ban matter, and also the issue of illegal construction uh, under the MRTP Act, which you challenge 32A. Uh, he has also defended Easter in the bail application. He has defended Indra Jay Singh and Anand Grover in the FCRA matter. Uh, he has also, uh, on the, uh, on the uh, at the time of the riots, the issue of relief uh, given, which was not being extended properly, he went to Ahmedabad and uh, uh, took up that case and fought for it on it. So I looked at this topic and initially I thought, well, you know, it's really important because this is a friend. And what she has done only, I think we know how much she has contributed to it. But I think Tista and Manshu are symptoms. And the issue is much larger than them. And I really am going to digress. Because I believe that in many ways we are living in the 25th hour. And that what you are seeing in Tista's case or Manshu's case or anyone else's case is just a small tip of an iceberg which is going to erupt one of these things. So I am going to digress in two areas. I want to see where we have come that something like this can happen. How we reach there? What the court did to either enable it or to stop it? And what hope there is of judicial recourse in such situations. So it's, I am going to digress out, but I am not going to, you see if I was to tell you that of course it's atrocious what they've done to this time. Of course that the judgment of Justice Kangalka is a stain actually. It's a blemish on judicial conscience and constitution. But these are right words, we all know that. What we have to understand is how we ended up here and where are we, which is far more important. I believe, I'll, I'll, I'll come to the end and then go somewhere. That there were conflicting ideas of India. There was the Gandhi, Nehru, Ambedkar idea of India. The one of religious equality, of tolerance. And there was the Savarkar, Gurwalkar idea of India. Which was, which has now been short formed into Hindutva. In independence, the Nehru Ambedkar idea won and it remained that way for years. I am only giving you the summary of the end and I will tell you why we reached where we are. But somewhere in the last 10 years, 8 years, we are now in the Savarkar version of India. Let's have no bones about it. The constitution remains, all those fancy words, the nice clauses, the institutions, the courts, the election commission, but they mean very little. You are now living in Savarkar's India. De facto, you are very limited recourse. Why I want to say this is very often we don't believe what's happening around us and we delude ourselves into thinking it's not happening. So, when I look back, I think we're somewhere at the time of the Weimar Republic in 1933 in Germany. And you're very close to Catholic history events. I want to therefore go back. I'm not being alarmist, but I'm being far more realist. 
It says that we pretend that we are the institutions of the state are there, the constitution is there, we are safe. Till they come to get you. Then you are like Tista or Imamshu or anyone else. There is very little recourse. So I don't want to spend 15 minutes in saying how we got here and the role the court played and then take it a bit on from there. Might be a little boring, but I'll try to make it brief. So let me go back to saying you we all know that India is a multicultural, very diverse society. In 1931, when the Congress had the Karachi session, Gandhi introduced the fundamental rights bill by saying that the essence of India is religious neutrality and religious tolerance. And he passed it at that time. At the same time, then and many years thereafter, there was a conflicting idea of India. It was first enunciated in, I think, the uh, 20s by Sabarkar in Who is a Hindu? They defined India as a culturally Hindu country, as an ethno religious identity. It's important to have these concepts because otherwise we can't understand why we are where we are. That's really the Hindu Rashtra concept. Now, uh, ethno religious identity, cultural identity, necessarily excluded all other religions and cultures. But Savarkar's gripe was about Muslims and Christians because he said they neither treat this as their holy land nor as their motherland. The others he was willing to tolerate. Govarka went a little further. In 1938, he said Muslims must entertain no idea but those of glorification of the Hindu race and culture. They may stay in this country, but wholly subordinated to the Hindu nation, claiming nothing, not even citizens' rights. These are important words because today you are living in Savarkar's India. Don't make a mistake about it. Gorvarkar went a little further. In the 30s, he talked of the minorities' problem, and he greatly appreciated Hitler's ability to cope with the minority problem. In the 1940s, when this went on, both Jinnah and Sabarkar believed in a two-nation theory. The difference was that Jinnah wanted a territory of undivided India which would be for Muslims. Sabarkar said no, Muslims can stay in the same land, but living in a subordinate position to Hindus. That is very clear to him. Now, in 1947, there were conflicting views. There was the Gandhi Nehru Ambedkar view of a plural multicultural India. And there was the Savarkar Gurwalkar view, which talked of it as a majoritarian state, a religious cultural Hindu state. In 1947, the Ambedkarites, the Gandhiites had their day. Rajman Gandhi, speaking on this, said it's very important to realize that it's not a two nation theory. It was a Pakistan and a multicultural plural India. Although it's, of, it's often termed by the RSS and the BHP as the unfinished agenda, because their view has always been that if the Muslims were Pakistan, it's a short change to say that the Hindus can't get the Hindus stuff. Basically, that's been the way it has. Now, we can fast forward. As late as 1973, the Supreme Court of India in Keshavanandi said secularism was a part of our basic constitutional framework. In 1976, the word secularism was introduced for the first time in the constitution. When Ambedkar had been very careful to avoid the word secularism because secularization and secularism is a whole new debate which I don't want to waste time on now. But the 1980s the problem started. The Congress party, according to me, undermined secularism by playing up to voting blocks and stoking divisive pressures. In 1985, 
an inexperienced Rajiv Gandhi buckled under pressure from Muslim groups and bought the Shah Banu Amendment, which was really the beginning of the end as I saw it. They were concerned about losing Hindu support and being called pseudo-secular. He sought to mollify Hindu sentiments by giving concessions on the Ayodhya issue. Don't forget that Rajiv Gandhi opened the gates of the Ayodhya mosque. People forget that, wasn't it? In fact, the BJP was a non-entity at that time and it did not have this on its agenda at all. The unlocking of the gates was manipulated through a judicial order with the aid of the Uttar Pradesh government under Congress control. Then there was, of course, the massive uh, uh, Ayodhya movement and the Babri Masjid demolition in 1992 where Prime Minister Narasimha Rao spent those four hours in inexplained solitude doing nothing to stop it while everything was happening around him. The government then dismissed four BJP governments on the basis that they were too inclined towards the Ayodhya movement to do justice in the matter. In 1994, a nine-judge bench dealt with a challenge to this the dissolution of four state assemblies and said that secularism has a positive as well as a negative content. One of which was that the state and the executive cannot espouse a religion. And they said that was an affirmative duty. They even went further that if a state government was to espouse religion and act contrary to the mandate of secularism, it should be removed as a failure of constitutional machinery. The only problem is, while talking about the states, they forgot that this could be at the center. And who dismisses the central government? No one. But it's a conundrum which no one had even thought of at that time. Now, immediately after the uh, Bombay judgment of 94, there were state elections, especially in Maharashtra. A lot of campaigning went on Hindutva. If you remember Manwar Joshi's Hindustan state and all uh, Prabhu's case and all that. The Bombay High Court struck down 12 elections on the grounds that they were clearly pandering to religion and religious identities. The matter went to the Supreme Court in 96. And it's interesting, but Justice Varma, and this is where the complicity of the Supreme Court comes in, which we must know, although people rarely talk of it. In 96, Justice Varma was part of the Bomai bench, now entered in the matter in which vituperative comments had been made on Hindutva's basis. He then referred to diverse takes on Hinduism and then made the interesting snake of hand movement which equated Hindutva with Hinduism. Then he said, Hinduism is a way of life. So is Hindutva a way of life. So it's not a matter of religion. So they can't be bigotry. In effect, by that one movement, he undermined the entire secular basis of India because he licensed a rampant appeal to political Hinduism on the grounds that it was a way of life in religion. Immediately following that matter, the same batch was Manohar Joshi's matter. In Manohar Joshi's matter, he had gone so far as to say that Maharashtra should be the first Hindu state. Now, how to deal with that? So, Varma then came up with this idea that this is an aspirational state. It's not an appeal to religion. He then said, in Prabhu's case, I've already decided that an appeal to Hindutva is not an appeal to religion. And so he dealt off Manohar Joshi also the matter. These two decisions stand if they can be in a hall of judicial infamy because they opened the door to where we are today. It, they, they legitimized it. In a short while, from two seats in 1984, the BJP won 161 seats in the Lok Sabha and became the single largest party there. During all these years that came up after that, there has been a change in the narrative. Secularism is appeasement. 
Secularism is secularism. Benefits to majority community is a matter of faith. And there the equivalence came. And after the BJP won the 2014 and 2019 elections, the process of subversion of our constitutional secularism and the imposition of a majority ethnocracy in peace. We have to realize where we came from. What has happened then? The virtual exclusion of the Muslim from the political sphere. The last three members of parliament, the Muslim members of parliament, the BJP, resigned a few days ago. Now there isn't a single Muslim member of parliament in the BJP. There has not been a Muslim MLA in any of the assemblies. So the Muslim has ceased to become relevant politically. And the strategy of the BJP has been to say that if we polarize and uh, consolidate Hindu votes, we don't need Muslim votes. And the exclusion of Muslim votes is a matter of irrelevancy thereafter. And then with the political exclusion of the Muslim, comes brazen majoritarian politics, privileging of a majority community, the ethnicization of the state when the whole cabinet goes to Ayodhya, where everyone prays. I'm not saying cultural prayer is bad, but this is an ethnicization of the state itself. And a shift to a majoritarian politics which has succeeded in bringing the narrative that any form of secularism is actually a piece of politics and therefore results in more polarization. The most important thing is the targeting of fraternization. The BJP's policy and Sabarkar's policy was a complete non-fraternization between Muslims and Hindus. So therefore you have love jihad, you have all these riots where someone tries marrying in your faith. Are there allegations of converting young Hindu women, which are so rare that becomes a whole major narrative, a narrative of fear and paranoia. And then there are laws. Do you know that in Gujarat, they have a stratagem of declaring a town of disturbed area. Once it's a disturbed area, a government can prevent a Muslim from buying a house in a Hindu area. Or from a Hindu selling a from a block to a Muslim. And when uh, the chief minister was asked in 2019, he said they have set this rule in areas where there have been riots to tell the Muslims that they might buy property only in their own areas. And then, of course, you pass laws which criminalize cow slaughter and beef. That's another saga. For five constitution benches in 50 years, the Supreme Court had allowed Bullock slaughter beyond the surface. An eight judge bench under Justice Lawati reversed all those judgments by saying that those judgments had not realized that after the Bullock becomes inappropriate for agriculture, it still gives dung. And Justice Bathur, in a dissent, has said, it is a little strange to say the five constitution benches over 50 years did not know that Gulags give down. <laughs> That's the way life is. Then, banning non vegetarian food in holy cities. For example, now, the state of UPA banned orders in Haridwar, Rishikesh, Barasana, Ayodhya, Chitrakut, Devan. In 21, they notified 22 out of 70 wards in Mathura and Vindavan as only pilgrimage sites, banning the sale of non-vegetarian food. And then, more ominous for all of us, there is this osmosis between state action and vigilante action, which should also remind you of the 32s and the 33s, where the SA actually became a part of government later. So the vigilante groups, they have a movement called a Gao Ramshadda, they liaise with the police. They intercept whenever they think there is cow movement. They brutally assault anyone. If he's a Hindu, then he gets off lighter. 
with a Muslim he dies. Then of course the vigilantes also attack anyone who marries a Hindu woman or you know or interfaith marriage. They're always there. In fact, it's become such a problem that people are wondering whether under the Special Marriage Act you should give notice. Because the moment you give notice, that is given to the vigilante groups who so they pile in on you. I'm not, I'm saying this only as exemplary, uh, exemplification of where we have come from where we were. And then there is a troll army which lampoons, harasses, victimizes everyone from Arun Shuri for his uh, son who is not born properly there to all, and this propaganda uh, breaks is carried on with no response. And you must understand, judges don't live in an ivory tower. And judgments, especially of constitutional courts, are always affected by the social, political environment in which they exist. I'll give you a simple answer. Take a map like Ayodhya. When the masjid was demolished in 19, everyone, including the new people, expressed remorse, regret. No one would have suggested. Then came the movements, the Ayodhya movement, the BJP coming to power. When the matter was heard 10 years later, it was unthinkable to restore the mosque. The matter had been lost before it was out. The court may put it in all the good language it wants, but I have no doubt that a large part of the judgment was necessarily influenced by the context of the political mobilization of the time, which made it impossible to do anything else. So you have Justice uh, of Chandrachu probably mentioning it as an egregious wrong in the Indian constitution and then awarding the land over. But that's because the Ayodhya matter was lost before it was up. It was lost in the politics of India. Then there has been this relentless attack on secularism. In fact, it's interesting to note that when Modi had his 2009 victory, in his speech, he mentioned, he mocked his opponents by saying that no political party had mustered the courage to mention the word secularism. And he was right. In fact, Hamid Ansari, his vice president, stated later that the term secularism has almost gone from the political vocabulary, replaced by secularism, as they call it, and by pseudo secularism or appeasement. In fact, to see how far it's gone, a couple of years back, the governor of Bishra Koshyari, the chap who's there still, wrote a letter to Thackeray in which he said, have you suddenly turned secular yourself? In a very pejorative tone. This is the governor in his official capacity writing that. The prime minister, the home minister from time to time, make latitudinous statements. Sabka saad, sabka vikas. But this is not just that. They ensure that what they can't do, everyone under them does. And with the cover of the state. So make no mistake, this isn't the fringe. The fringe is the government. That's the way it is today. In fact, today, so effective have they been, that even opposition parties are playing a soft Hindutva line. They can't muster up the courage to stand for constitutional principles. Now it is in these circumstances that we are here today. These constitutional rights, 14, 19, 29, 30, all remain. The court remains. But it really means very little today. Let me assure you, you are making a great mistake if you think you are living in Gandhi's India. You will have the unfortunate consequence of being where Pista is. Pista is not an aberration. She is just a more visible aberration. Today the norm is that you are, you are living in a completely different India. Where you do not have the rights you think you have. 
then you do not have the recourse which you think you have and which it's important to understand and acknowledge. Therefore, I've come to the conclusion, and which I feel is the end of the first part, I hope I've stayed too long, is that we are now living in Sabarkar's India. And you have to accept that. If you make the mistake of thinking you're living in the India where you were brought up in, born in, you're making a terrible mistake which will have great consequences for you. In Savarkar's India, the government shows no inhibitions in using state machinery, CBI, ED, whatever it is, or the Delhi police, which is like a washing machine, to target whatever it sees as its opponents and players, or those who try to defend the old order and the old principles, and to ensure that politicians, who always have some skeletons in their cover are made to vote for the right party and change their affiliation. You use UFPA against students. You bulldoze the homes of persons whom you think took part in riots. And then you of course lie to your, to your teeth to the Supreme Court to say, you know, no, this is only town planning and I planned it long back. Coupled with a complete decimation of institutions like the Election Commission or the CDC or almost all your institutions. Now, that brings me to probably the end of that part. Where do the courts go with this? The courts enable this by the 96th judgment. Make no bones about it. And they've never gone back to correct that error. Even now, once in a while they show courage. But by and large, they remain mute spectators or they use big words which mean little. Let me tell you for example, when the freezing of the internet took place in Kashmir, our present Chief Justice sat on a bench which heard the matter for months on it. Then he passed an enormous judgment in which he said that internet is part of Article 19 -1. And then what did he do? He said, well, I must leave it to the government to decide when they will bring back it. Now, if, if you were going to leave it to the government, why spend all this time? Or take the Pegasus story, which is an even more funny one. The petition is that the government is misusing Pegasus illegally in India. The government refuses to file an affidavit. The additional solicitor in general says, I won't file an affidavit. The normal consequence of being the court says, if you don't file, you don't deny, it's true, you are misusing it. Then they should have given. Instead of which they set up a technical committee. Now what is a technical committee going to do in this matter? And that's where we are today. Or take Mohammed Zubair's case for that matter. A 2018 tweet of his regarding a movie which had been passed in 1983 by the Central Board is raked up by a Twitter account which mysteriously disappears after raking up issue. No one knows where it went. The police immediately lodge an FIR on that. When he gets bail or attempts to get bail in one, six other are activated. Now, Zubair was probably lucky that in the end of the day, he got bail. But Zubair is the exception. Let's go back to Nupur Sharma's case. The court initially declined to hear a petition. Said it was a disgrace that she had set India on fire and that she should apologize to the country. They also noted an interesting factor. The Delhi police file an FIR to protect all these government people. What they do is, they file an FIR so that other governments can't arrest them. But they take no steps in the matter. So, in fact, the court pointed out that Sharma was not even questioned. She gave a statement once, no arrest. Supreme Court said this, there was a human cry. There was a troll army. Many of them even said that Justice Pardiwala, because he was a Parsi, all Parsi should go back to Iran. I made it myself. I'm not joking. You have to realize that bigot, and these are intelligent people. Bigotry has no bounds in India today. And then the VHP said, how could you do this for forgetting 1400 years of aggression? What happened? A few weeks later, Nupur Sharma refiles a petition. And this time they give her anything. Yeah. And they stop all people from.
from arresting her anywhere. Delhi police will of course not arrest her. So she remains free. It is in this context that the Supreme Court's judgment in Zakia falls for consideration. Why did I say this? Because this is not a one person situation. There is an infrastructure today, a political infrastructure today, which will attack, harm, and victimize anyone who fights back. And you must realize that this is not the, the Marquis of Queensbury's rules being played here. They will find your vulnerabilities and they will attack you and they will hound you. Now, what is the recourse? In Tista's case, a 452 page judgment is delivered. Then in paragraph 307, they make those rather strange comments. You know, about uh, coalesced effort of disgruntled officials along with others to create a sensation by making relevations which were false. There is an audacity to question the integrity of functionaries involved to keep the pot boiling for ulterior designs and that they need to be in the dark. In Savarkar's India, these words were more than enough. In Gandhi's India, nothing would have happened. But in Savarkar's India, these words immediately left to an effort and an arrest. And let me put it this way. Uh, whatever be the merits of the main I don't mind at all. Whatever be the merits of the main judgment, these words in paragraph 307 are procedurally unfair and amount to judicially licensing revenge. They are very serious words. When the Supreme Court says you should be proceeded against, how many people down the line are going to take a different view, especially in Savarkar's India? Sethubha had never been issued a notice that any action was proposed to be taken against her or that any findings would be recorded against her. She had, by tireless efforts, ensured through the Supreme Court often the reinvestigation of many Gujarat cases, the conviction of so many people. This must probably be, I say with respect, the lowest ever of judicial conscience in India to make these sort of comments about her. Really a low ever. This part of the judgment should, and I hope will be treated as a blemish on the constitutional conscience of the Supreme Court. It should and will be treated as a blemish on the record of the Supreme Court. It will be remembered, I hope, in the lines of the Indian Jabalpur case, which talked of the diamond bright, diamond hard hope of the court in the times of the emergency, and which took about 20, 30 years to realize there was a disgrace and a blot on India's judicial record. Hopefully, this part of the judgment will meet the fate in time to come of the Indian Jabalpur, and that the court will itself rectify this for I think a grave error. But I want to stress for every Zubair or for even a Tista, there are many others. Just think about it. There is Mr. Uh, Siddiqui Kapan. He went to Hathras. In, uh, he was a Kerala journalist. He was arrested in October 20. He's gone to the Supreme Court twice. He's still under arrest. The Bhima corridor accused. They did an arrest from June 2018. And when the NBA government tried reinvesting the cases, they promptly transferred them to the NIA. And the NIA then puts all these absurd charges, including assault on Modi and assassination, and you don't get bail. Or Sharki Salima arrested in December in uh, March 20 in the CA riots, still there. So, I went beyond my topic because I don't think Tista is the topic. Tista is a symptom of the times you are in. These are very, very dangerous times. What we knew of India and what we grew up in doesn't exist. And if you don't recognize that, it will be to your peril. Maybe there is a future. Who knows? Majoritarian movements often end up in grief 
decades down the line. Maybe there are wars, maybe there are riots, maybe countries fall apart, one doesn't know. But as of today, these constitutional rights remain by and large effortable. If you are lucky to go to the right bench of the Supreme Court, you might get luck and might get it. But there is every chance you won't. And there is every chance you remain incarcerated. So you have to realize today that defenders of civil liberties or citizens or whatever it is, you speak out, you object, you stand in great risk. Do it by all means, but don't be under any illusions that consequences won't fall. I hate to say this, but I think you need to know a lot of the people in 1933 and 34 thought this could never happen, that this could never happen to them. They were so well settled, they were so intellectually advanced, they were all involved in business. But these things do happen. Nations do tend to lose balance. And when majoritarian movements and ethnicity of this nature is advanced, one never knows where it is. That's all. Thank you. Um, I think Aspi has, uh, has given a, a, an absolutely brilliant uh, uh, you know, framework in which we, we live and, and uh, explaining the genesis 